In the discussion of historical civilizations, it is well known by many that one of the first prominent and meaningful civilizations in the Western world was Egypt. As a melting pot of various cultures thanks to the Nile River and its vast resources, Egypt has had a long and proud history that dates back way into the era before Christ. It is no exaggeration to say that, were it not for the prosperity of and power of Egypt and its empire, the world we know today would simply not exist. For this reason, it seems only natural that For Honor would draw from that bountiful treasure trove of culture and bring us a warrior. Enter the Magi, wielding an exotic weapon and bearing a ferocious countenance. These foreign warriors bring their own unique culture and experience to the world of For Honor. But who are they? Who are they based on? And what did the real world counterparts offer to Egypt? Let's talk about it. Welcome back to Heroes in History, where we take a look at all of For Honor's heroes and discuss who they are most likely based on and if they do their counterparts justice. Today, we're looking at the brand new hero to For Honor, Magi. Let's start by discussing the Magi and For Honor before we go into the historical counterpart. Magi are described as the guardians of their land and culture. When Egypt collapsed under the destruction of the Cataclysm, the Magi endured, seeking to preserve and protect the cultural significance and wealth of knowledge they once believed so firmly in. However, with nothing but ruins, tombs, and broken down landmarks that mark their home, the Magi have had to evolve from mere defenders to more aggressive soldiers who must not only maintain the peace, but repel would-be invaders, robbers, and brigands. They fight using an exotic weapon called a dual palm axe, or fan axe by some, a long staff with two fan blades on either side, which can be broken into two parts to act as dual axes if necessary. According to the lore, when Neferka, the last line of pharaohs, went to Heathmore to undo the damage done by Bolthorn, he brought an army of his magi with him. After undoing the curse, the magi see a land in need of guidance, and are here to fight for what they believe is right, whatever that may mean to them. Now, while I have some personal grievances with the narrative used for the Magi, what we have here is pretty clear-cut in terms of who they are historically. The Magi are quite obviously based on the historical Magi of ancient Egypt. I'm sure this comes to a surprise to no one, as the developers mention it themselves in a live stream and the name they carry is a direct reference. But how close are they to the real thing? Well, historically... The term Magi didn't refer to warriors at all. In fact, the first recorded usage of the term Magi dates back to the Old Kingdom of Egypt, which is dated around 2700 to 2200 BC. The term was used to refer to people from the land of Meja, which is a land believed to have been located just east of the second cataract of the Nile in Nubia. The lands of Nubia at that time was called Taseti, meaning land of the bow, which was a testament to the military skill of the people there. However, Egyptian documents of that time indicate that the lands of Meja and other Nubian regions were still under the subjugation of Egypt at that time, meaning that the Magi were not enemies of Egypt, but not truly citizens either. In fact, it's widely believed that the Magi and their ilk were nomadic peoples moving about the region and settling where they could be prosperous. Sometime around the late Middle Kingdom and early New Kingdom eras, the Magi were hired as soldiers and mercenaries to fight on behalf of certain pharaohs, including Kamose, the last pharaoh of the 17th dynasty. This helped establish Egypt as a military power in the 18th dynasty of Egypt, which would allow Egypt to begin its expanse into Hyksos territory, as well as into the kingdom of Kush. This would not be the only place in which the Magi peoples were used as soldiers, as the kingdom of Kush would make use of them as well for military matters, and even the Roman Egyptian army in 30 BC would hire out these skilled mercenaries. Although, and to be fair, the requirements for being hired into the Roman auxilia wasn't exactly strict, the question they usually asked was, can you throw a javelin, shoot a bow, drive a chariot, or swing a sword? If you answered yes to any of the above, you're hired. Grab a pack and slay a barbarian in the name of Rome. <laughs> Centurions everywhere are quite pleased. Now, with all that said, though, it's clear that For Honor isn't quite taking influence from the ethnic Nubian people of Meja. They're referring to the other use of the term Magi. Yes, for those who are not quite aware, Magi was used only for a time as a term for an ethnicity. It would later come to be used as the term for the Egyptian police force. During the 18th dynasty of Egypt, which lasted from 1550 to 1292 BC, the term Magi had come to be associated with not only the local police and guardian forces, but even the act of policing itself. One could say that you are Magiing other people, in other words. This is because there had never been a true police force in Egypt as we would understand it. For the most part, law enforcement was done by palace guards, soldiers, or local civilians willing to take up arms against those who did wrong. The military of Egypt was its police force, and as such, when the Magi were brought in as part of the military, they started taking on an important role in policing. 
However, it's important to know that not all Magi under this classification were themselves Nubian. Though it might have begun that way, as the strength of Egypt grew through the 18th dynasty into the 19th, the military too grew, and as such there was more policing to be done. Thus, the term Magi came to refer to the police as a whole. Magi was specifically required to defend valuable locations like tombs, palaces, and areas of significance, particularly in Thebes, the capital of Egypt at the time. Magi chiefs, according to historic records, all had Egyptian names and were depicted as Egyptian as well, meaning that they were likely pure-blood Egyptians and chosen specifically by the pharaoh or one of his advisors. The Magi chieftains were in charge of dealing out discipline in the ranks, enforcing local law, and maintaining peace in Egyptian-controlled lands. Perhaps the most important task of the Magi was protecting tombs. This might seem an odd task, but it is recorded that, most com that the most common crime in ancient Egypt was robbery, specifically tomb robbery. Ancient Egyptians believed that pharaohs might take some of their material treasures to the next life with them, so they were often buried with their treasures and valuables. Thus, it wasn't uncommon for desperate peasants and slaves to attempt to steal from the tombs to make their fortunes. To not desecrate the dead and to preserve societal peace, the Magi were charged with defending these crypts with their lives if necessary. Now, in terms of tools, typically Magi are shown carrying around staves and perhaps even police dogs. However, it would not be unlikely that a Magi carried with him possibly a co pastor club of some variety. The hierarchy of the Magi was also simple enough to understand. You had the chief of the Magi, who was personally chosen by the pharaoh or his advisors, as said before, and these chiefs were stationed at key important towns and cities within the Egyptian empire. Under these chiefs were lieutenants who helped to coordinate the standard Magi in their day-to-day -day activities. And at the border regions of the empire, the Magi as a police force was far less necessary, as the military of Egypt could police the region just fine on their own. Remember that at this point in time, in the 18th dynasty, Egypt was expanding greatly into faraway lands, and thus the military had to maintain order in newly conquered territories. No need to bother with police when military occupation is all that's required. However, and sadly, the Magi are not mentioned in the historical record again after the 20th dynasty, which ended in 1077 BC. Historians are unsure why the Magi faded from history at this point. It's possible the name of the police changed at this time, or perhaps it was because, as an empire, Egypt was beginning to decline as a superpower at this point in history. Personally, I think it makes a certain degree of sense that the latter is true. See, in the 19th, in the 19th dynasty, we see the rule of Ramesses II, considered the greatest pharaoh in history. It is believed he was the pharaoh who suffered the wrath of God via Moses in the book of Exodus. Which would make sense, as the pharaohs who came after him never obtained quite the power or expanse that he did, and the 20th dynasty of Egypt, considered to be the decline of ancient Egypt, was filled with infighting, coup attempts, and the decline of several territories that Egypt once held with an iron hand. It's possible that, as the military strength of Egyptian began to falter, the police too faltered with it. Now, in either case, we have no documented evidence of Magi activity in Egypt after the 20th dynasty. So I'm sure that leaves some of you asking, what about Assassin's Creed Origins? Wasn't Bayek called a Magi? Yes, he was. And that story took place in the Ptolemaic Egypt era in 47 BC. It's safe to say Assassin's Creed took some liberties with its history there. Let's be real honest. Now, comparing the real Magi to the For Honor version, what are the similarities? The Magi in For Honor, as noted by another YouTuber slanderous, is the only hero who, no matter what skin tone you choose, will always have a dark complexion. This might be in reference to the Nubian heritage of the early Magi, as the Nubians were noted as being darker skinned than local Egyptians. However, the lighter skin tone variants are closer to localized Egyptians, so it's not a major issue of contention. The Magi weapon is a Fanax staff, which, based on my research, might have existed, but had limited use. And before anyone comes down on me, no, it totally existed. I tried looking up any, you know, historical antiques, maybe something in a museum or something in a lab that we've discovered. I found nothing. Most of the ones that I found are either from China, where we know Egypt wasn't, and they were probably Buddhist staves. The others are all online digital 3d creations so it's hard to say if they ever existed they might have there's some reason to believe that they might have as we see some hieroglyphs with what look like those weapons on them so maybe they existed but even if they did exist they probably had limited use it probably was not a common weapon and i'd go so far as to say that it would almost have little military value frankly i'd sooner give it to a local police of egypt than the military why a few reasons Firstly, the weapon the Magi use, well, does not exist. I don't mean a fan axe, that might have, but a weapon with blades on both ends? 
That's inherently dangerous in principle, as swinging with one side will expose the other side to you. Not only this, but detaching and retaching pieces of weaponry in the middle of a battle is dangerous and unnecessary when a spear, bow and arrow, or normal sword or axe are far more useful and efficient. When it comes to battlefield weapons, the question is not how deadly and versatile is this. The question should be how hard is it to use and train other people in its use. Consider, for example, the difference between a sword and a spear. A sword might have more versatility in use, but it takes longer to master a sword and to use it properly. A spear is more limited in application, but it takes almost no time to explain the usage. Now this weapon, the fan axe, is built like a long spear, but the end is not pointed for thrusting, rather it's curved for cutting. That means that instead of thrusting forward, you're swinging side to side. The problem here is the shape itself will not allow it to cut deeply with just a thrust forward or a slash. Shallow cuts from this weapon will likely be unreliable on the battlefield. In order to get meaningful strikes, you'd have to be in close, hacking away numerous times to get the proper amount of damage. A normal axe would have it so that the blade is facing forward so that when you swing down, you're getting all of the blade into the target. This one has the blade curved away, so if you were to swing down, not all of the blade is being used. So, you'd have to get close, hack away numerous times, or try to get the damage you want. However, as a Royal Guard or policeman, this weapon likely might have had some meaning and presence. It bears resemblance to fans used in the Royal Court, hence the name, Fan Axe, meaning it wouldn't look out of place in a palace, and it also appears rather austere, and where austerity is necessary, lethality likely won't be. The real Fan Axe, if it existed, was likely around 5 to 6 feet in length and had a counterweight on the end, and likely saw more use among the guards and police of Egypt than the actual military. But since the Medjai and For Honor are supposedly based on the Medjai police, this fits more or less for him, so no problems there. Now, the Medjai's desire to protect the tombs and relics of their ancient civilization actually fits perfectly for them, as this was the original and important mandate of the original Medjai. I even see something kind of impressive in Neferka, wanting, to, wanting nothing more than to reclaim what was stolen from him, as it's a piece of his heritage and he wants it back. I think where it fails is when the Medjai say that they see a land in need of guidance. The Medjai historically didn't guide. They protected the sacred places in the lands. They were police, not guiders. They had no interest in bringing stability to other lands outside of their own, so that's where I see this falling out. Now, aside from ties to history, Medjai also seems to have a lot of mythological references in and outfits as well. But before we get into the outfits, it's important to note the sharp increase in military strength that the Egyptians obtained in the New Kingdom period when the Medjai were around. After their war with the Hyksos, Egypt developed charioteers, stronger archery capabilities using composite bows, and began perfecting their military by introducing scaled armor, at least for the charioteers. However, infantry of Egypt still remained less armored. Most of the armor you'd see might be more cloth or at most scaled armor, which would likely only be exclusively used by Pharaoh or his higher officers. The Usak collar you see on the early armors of the Medjai would not be armored and was primarily worn as jewelry. I do like how they use it, in armor and use it as armor here, but it historically wasn't. Later on, as you move through the armor sets, we get a mummy-like armor with a green mask called the Revenant set. There are two ways to look at this armor. One is its unique um, collar and aspects. You see, think about the metal here. Since the ancient Egyptians lacked the metallurgy to create steel, they settled for bronze, as this was during the Bronze Age of the world. Bronze does not rust as it ages like steel or iron, but instead turns greenish in color. Because bronze is 88% copper, it will oxidize over time when exposed to oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water. This creates a greenish color, so perhaps this greenish color indicates that the armor is old, ancient, and worn, and that it could be the mask of some royal pharaoh from long ago. However, this might also be inspired by the Egyptian god Osiris. Osiris was the god of fertility, death, resurrection, and life. He is noted as being the father of Horus, having a green face, wearing an Atef crown on his head, and bearing a slight mummification wrapping around his arms and legs. See, it's believed that when his brother Set cut him into pieces, his wife Isis found all the pieces and bound them together again using mummification wrapping forms. Osiris was also considered a judge of the dead to some. Now, later you can gain access to a dog-like helm that resembles a jackal in the Undertaker set. This is likely a reference to the god Anubis who bore a jackal head. Anubis was once the lord of the underworld until the Middle Kingdom period when Osiris would take up the role. Anubis' job was to weigh the soul of the dead on the scale. If the soul was lighter than a feather, then they were permitted to enter paradise. If not, their souls were fed to Amit, the crocodile. 
Now, Anubis was more than just a god of death, but also a defender of tombs and pharaohs. His visage is one of most famous in all of Egyptian gods. Like, most people know Anubis without even having to know much about Egyptian mythology. Now, after that, you can obtain the Magistrate set, which is a crocodile head. Marco Yolo, in his video, was uncertain if this was a reference to Amit or Sobek. At first, I thought it was Amit, but after careful study, I'm going to lean on it being influenced by Sobek. For one thing, Amit was not worshipped as a god, but more feared as a beast. Amit's job was to consume the souls of the wicked. It had the form of a lion with a crocodile head. It embodied all that the Egyptians feared, the end of even your afterlife. Meanwhile, Sobek saw a great deal of respect, particularly around the time of the Middle Kingdom when he became closely associated with Horus. He became a god associated with power, military strength, and fertility, and as such, he represents the militarism of Egypt. I also want to take this moment to point out that the chest armor of the Magistrate set looks like it could be Lamellar, which would not have existed in Egypt during this time, but whatever, most people won't realize that anyway, I'll let it slide. Finally, you have the Falcon or Eagle head set. This set could be one of two gods, Horus or Ra. Ra was the sun god and closely connected to heaven and the pharaoh, while Horus was a god of the sky and played various roles, particularly as a son of Isis and Osiris. Seeing as the incredible importance of Horus and Ra, it doesn't surprise me that they'd get a set, so I'm willing to give it to either one. Now, there's far more mythology of Egypt being portrayed in Medjai's appearance than even what I've said. Perhaps later I'll do another video going over some of the other cultural and mythological connections therein, but I fear we're going to bore you with all this, so I'll save that for another time. But what else can be said about the Magi at this point? It's a simple truth of history, guys. Where there are people, they will create a culture. And where there is a culture, there will be those who defend and uphold it. The Magi in history were vagabonds and nobads of Nubia, finding their home in the land of Egypt where they flourished as warriors and police. So closely did they merge into this culture that it became their own, and soon the Magi were no longer just an ethnic group, but an entire aspect of society for the Egyptians, merging with multiple different ethnicities, colors, and creeds. Their legacy is one mired in combat, duty, and even honor. They now join the war in for honor because the culture that they had become so devoted to has been taken from them, and they will do everything in their power to get it back, even war against those whom they have never known and may never find peace with. But that is what it means to stand for something greater than yourself. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you in my next video. Take care. It's been a pleasure murdering you, fella. Double kill. Holy crap, this goes on forever. Triple kill.
overkill. Kill tacular. We meet again. Only this time, for the first time. Depth perception, pal. Look into it. Holy crap, this goes on forever. In your last moment, you will not escape. Any solace you can find, but it's just you and me, Titan! Kill Trocity. Mission failed. We'll get him next time.